guys, Nary here from Drake Wing Gaming. Something to me on Twitter, The Gaming Dragon. Today, I'm coming back at you with a new Let's Play episode of Supernova, The Baron's Path. So, guys, I just updated the latest build, and the new build actually adds an interlude for when you are done with the with the current paths. And uh, we're gonna check that out after I finish the Baron's Path. It's got some pretty juicy content, from what I heard. It's about like uh, 10 to 15 minutes long, so you should just take one video, get that over with. Anyway, guys, please sit back and enjoy for this 18 minutes will entertain you. Let's jump right in. Alarm saying you are up, and let's go, girl. All right. <laughs> Starting with multiple ellipses. All righty. Lucas leaves early for an exam while I spend the morning making myself presentable. My head fur is getting stubborn, and it takes a while for me to tame it. I put on my suit and tie, then wait for Vince. About half an hour later, I get the message that he's almost here, and I head outside. <clears throat> Morning, Vic! Vince is dressed for the occasion as well, his oversized biceps and shoulders bulging through the heavy f the navy fabric of his suit as he grips the steering wheel. Morning! I hesitate, unsure if I should ride shotgun or leave the seat open for Nisus. In the end, I decide to just get in the front seat. Vince gives me a questioning glance, but doesn't say anything otherwise. How- how are you feeling? Good, I- I mean... Well, you know. Yeah, I think I do. I discover that Nisus lives around five blocks down from Grifton. He's waiting for us in front of an old-fashioned but decent-looking apartment building. The fox looks a little awkward, shoulders hunched and paws in his pants pockets. He brightens up a little when the car comes to a stop at the curb. Hey, you two! For the next ten minutes, we drive in silence. I'm told the cemetery is about an hour away, just outside the southern suburbs. Nisus seems content to just gaze out the window, and Vince is focused on the road. I fidget with the buttons on my suit. So, I've been meaning to ask something. Yeah? What was Templar like, you know, as a person? Vince gives me a sideways glance. He was a hero through and through. The folk loved him for a reason, you know. He was brave and strong, and he loved helping people. Always did what he always did what he did with a grin. A wide grin. He pauses, then laughs. I guess you wouldn't be able to tell with the helmet and all. But trust me, he loved doing what he did. Saving people, helping all of it. I guess that's the kind of image that Templar had in my, my, my head. Even if it seems a little, I don't know, boring? I turn my head to look at Frank, but he doesn't meet my eyes, instead gazing out the window. His voice is tinged with melancholy. He had this sense of conviction with whatever he did. Like he always knew who he was and what he needed to do, no matter the situation. Really saw him hesitate, even when the circumstances were far from being black and white. Just dependable. Solid. He lets out a long sigh at the end. I sit in silence. It's a lot to live up to. Unbound said she doesn't expect me to. Well, more like she didn't think I can. It stings a little, but I guess it's up to me to try. I'm far from the steadfast, brave, heroic figure that Super Fang and Nisus are describing. That Templar is dead. I'm just a shoddy substitute. But I do intend to try. You'll be fine, Nick. Th thanks. At the risk of sounding cliche, you just don't know how, aw how awesome you are yet. He gives, me, you know, he gives me his signature thumbs up, eliciting a chuckle from me. I guess I'll just have to trust you on that one. Good. Heh. <laughs> oh, another thing. Yeah? Well, I still don't know what the Baron looks like. Under the helmet, I mean. I'll point him out to you. You don't have to talk with him today if you don't want to. No, it's fine. I'm supposed to be a student. It would be rude not to. Oh, yeah, because he's always so unflinchingly polite. I snort again. I snort. Again, he has a point. I think back to how many times I've seen Nisus and the Baron clash in the short time I've known them. Do you guys, like... Not get along? Vince gives me a nervous glance. We're fine, mostly. He just has uh, been a little insufferable since, you know. I don't know why, but I feel a pang of guilt in my chest, even though I know it is this isn't my fault. Again, don't worry about him. He'll chill out soon enough. Looking forward to it. He's a good person. Never said he wasn't. But... Ah, come on, Fang. Yes, he is a good person. A good person who's sometimes a complete ass. Vince's expression falls, but he doesn't get but he doesn't argue back. After that, Vince and I chat a little more about Templar. Nisus is still lost in his own thoughts. Only well, that Templar's real name was Michael O'Connor, and that he was an owner of a regular pub in the city. Patty's pub. A remarkably unremarkable occupation for someone like him to have. Not that I knew him well enough to make that judgment. It's just that famous superhero who moonlights as a bartender seems a little in seems a little incongruous. Ooh, excuse me. By then, we're by then we're in the flat suburbs south of Nova City, not run down, but a stark contrast to the lavish Magnolia Hills. 
Small squat houses line the narrow roads as we weave through. Something occurs to me when we turn onto the street leading up to the cemetery. Did Templar's family know about the superhero stuff? Hmm? Oh yeah, they all did. I don't think Shannon does, actually. That's Michael's younger daughter. Frank clarifies for my benefit. Really? Huh. Well, Sarah and Danny knew for sure. Danny was training to be the next Templar. Uh, oh. Um, yeah. Damn. That's Templar's son. Did they know about me? Yes, the Baron- yes, the Baron told them. Fuck! That's going to be awkward. Should I even talk to either of them? Seems kind of disrespectful if I didn't. Then again, would they want to talk to me? I grow more nervous as we approach our destination. Several cars are parked outside the walled entrance to the cemetery. Vince stops his and we shuffle out onto the sidewalk. I don't spot any people. I guess everyone's already in there. The air is crisp for this time of year, even as the sun shines overhead. As Vince goes ahead of us, I notice Frank lingering, struggling with his tie, the knot having loosened somewhat during our ride. Want some help? Uh, sure. He looks awkwardly to the side when I fiddle, while I fiddle with the tie. Dad is a stickler for proper dress, so I could do this with my eyes closed. There, all good. So, sorry about that. Th thanks, Nick. No worries. Frank looks at his watch. We're a bit late. Let's go. Vince is waiting for us just inside the metal gates. The cemetery is well maintained, polished stone and marble all around. As good a resting place as any. Spotting the small group that has gathered for Templar's funeral is easy with nothing but low gravestones blocking line of sight. I take note of the family of badgers at once. The middle-aged female must be Sarah, which makes the tall and broad male Danny, the younger girl Shannon. Frank nudges me and points to a tall, albino rat standing next to the window, next to the widow, rubbing her back with slow circular motions. So that's the Baron in black. The bound stands before the, towards the back. It's the first time I've seen her without her mask, but since I know what to look for, recognizing her is easy enough. The three of us move to join her. <laughs> the bear acknowledges our arrival with a nod. Meanwhile, the priest, the priest, a short mouse, is, re is reading through the scripture. I stand a bit to the side, letting the teammates mourn without me intruding. I feel out of place enough as it is. Besides the four sentinels, I don't know a single person here. I hate the thought that I was the last person who saw Templar, Mr. O'Connell, Mr. O'Connor, alive. Not his family, not his friends, not even his superhero teammates, but a random raccoon who just happened to be chilling in an abandoned condo in the hills. I couldn't even help him in the fight that killed him. Even then, he gave me his most valued possession. Maybe the Baron was right, and the Badger really was delirious. I'm sure got the casket that has yet to be lowered into the ground. I can't help but wonder if Templar, whoever he is now, regrets his last act. I guess it's up to me to make sure he won't. The priest finishes, and Danny steps forward to deliver the eulogy. The badger is stone-faced. I imagine he is trying his hardest to put on a stoic, a stoic appearance. According to Vince, he returned, he returned 18 some months ago, and he's still a senior in high school. I can't imagine how hard this must be for him. Still, his voice doesn't crack once, once as he speaks of his father. I'm startled to hear Vince sniffle next to me. He looks mortified as he tries to discreetly wipe his eyes with his sleeve. Tries because his size makes it rather hard to be discreet. Not that anyone is looking at him, besides me. Maybe he'd appreciate a small gesture of comfort. Who is this? Vince, yeah. Let him be. He doesn't need me right now. Bringing attention to his emotional state could just upset him more. I turn my attention back to the funeral. I try to focus on the younger bat on the young badger's words, but I can't stop staring at the hole in the ground. The music is so good. My mind is blank, a faint buzzing in my ears. I only look away when I realize Danny has, fin has finished delivering his eulogy. His younger sister is crying into her sleeve, with the Baron standing over her, paws on her shoulders. I take a quick look at Nisus and Unbound. The fox is just staring at the ground, paws in his pockets again, jaw tight. Unbound looks more composed, although there is obvious sorrow in her expression. Vince seems to have, re seems to have recovered and is now observing the proceedings calmly, but his tense and uncomfortable posture gives his true mood away. They begin lowering the casket. I hang back as the rest of the small crowd gets closer. Rest in peace, Templar. I don't know why you picked me for this job, but I'm going to do my damn best. I made up my mind about that already. They start covering the, gra the, they start covering the grave in dirt, and several of the attendees start wandering away, while others exchange brief, exchange brief words with Templar's family. The Sentinels are all here now, too. The Badgers. Vince, all, Vince gives all three a hug, his form trembling as he does so. I'm glad Templar's family has people like them around. The Baron hasn't left their side for even a moment. Again, I feel out of place. I think about just following some of the others to the gate, and where I'll just wait for Vince and Frank. 
The players are interrupted when I see the Baron is beckoning me with his paw while the O'Connor stare at me. Oh shit. I freeze, unsure what to do. I'm very much not prepared for this. I should have left sooner. It's not like I can just ignore this now. So I walk over, slow and awkward, feeling anxiety overtake me. Hey, Shannon! Why don't we take a short walk together? I saw something cool the other day I wanted to tell, tell you about. She nods dejectedly, and the two take their leave. The Baron adjusts his glasses and at, le and at last introduces me. Sarah, Daniel, this is Nick Saunders. I am very sorry for your loss. Sarah and her son regard me silently for several tense seconds, and to my surprise, the former gives me a slight smile. Thank you so much for coming, Nick. That was very nice of you. Michael would have appreciated it. Uh, uh, yes, of course, ma'am. The Baron opens his muzzle as if he intends to speak, but seems to reconsider. His expression is neutral, but I can still feel the weight of his gaze on me. It's as if he's telling me not to fuck it up. Oh boy. <laughs> Danny suddenly speaks up, his voice low, almost a growl. Show it to me! Daniel! The bracelet! I grit my teeth. I can tell Sarah's about to say something again, but I decide I should do this. Fumbling to roll up my sleeve, I reveal the reddish band on my wrist. Huh. This is the first time I've seen it out in the sun, and it looks much more vibrant in this light. It had this dull color while I was indoors. Now, not so much. There's a brief moment of silence, and Danny's muzzle contorts into an expression of rage. That's not yours! Take it off right now! He takes a step toward me, and despite myself, I cringe away. The badger may be only a couple years younger, but his height and physique are imposing. Daniel, stop right this second! The taller badger rounds on his mother. It's mine, and he has no right to it! How can you- Tim, dear, would you please escort Daniel back to the car? I'd like a moment with Nick. The Baron nods, putting a paw on Danny's shoulder and pushing him to the path leading to the gates. Come on, kiddo! Despite his continuing protest, Daniel is led away. Oh, one second, guys. Oh, man. I'm just, ah, uh, stuffy. Frank, who stood at my side during the entire exchange, follows them as does Unbound. I'm left alone with Templar's wife. Good lord, what is causing me to be so stuffy right now? I shuffle from one football to the other. I'm very sorry, Mrs. O'Connor. Your son is right. Sarah frowns for a moment, before smiling warmly at me again. You are not the one who should be apologizing, dear. I'm sure, I'm sure Daniel is just upset. I don't mean him, although my son owes you an apology for his behavior just now. I blink at her, not quite following what she's saying. Her smile fades, and she sighs with obvious exhaustion. You should have never been put in this situation in the first place. I'm so sorry if this is happening to you. I open my mouth, then realize I don't know what to say and close it. I didn't expect this at all. I thought she'd be as angry as Danny, rightfully so. Would you mind walking with me a little? Yes, ma'am, of course. I wander down the paved path between the rows of graves scattered in the grass. Sarah goes in the opposite direction from the gate. I'm, reluct I'm reluctant to follow. Even with the chill, I feel stuffy and suffocated in my suit. A bird, maybe a crow, makes a noise somewhere nearby. Can you... can you tell me what you saw that day? I skid to a stop. For a moment, I consider telling her that, that, that I'd much rather not. But I see her. I see a plea in her eyes that I can't just refuse. So I do as she asks. I tell her what happened, never going into the details of the fight. How brutal it was, how viciously the wolf attacked her husband. The blow that shed the blows that shattered his armor and rained down on his exposed flesh. She doesn't need to hear any of that. I just let it flash in front of my eyes while I stare at my feet the whole time I'm talking. I I'm sorry, Mrs. O'Connor. I, I didn't mean to upset you. She shakes her head. No, no, everything is all right. Th thank you, Nick. I'm sorry. She wipes her eyes with a handkerchief I offer, letting out another sigh. It's so strange to see that bracelet on someone else. She stares off into the distance somewhere, but not for long, as her gaze snaps back to me. This is all incredibly unfair to you. I can't help but feel angry at myself and Michael. How do you mean? Why would you be angry? Because he did this to you. You shouldn't, Mrs. O'Connor. He was a hero. I know, and I'll always be proud of who he was which doesn't change the fact that he had no right to inflict this burden on you. It was my decision to keep the bracelet. She nods. You are very brave. Not really. Nor Nick, I, I, nor Nick. I mean it. No, Nick, I mean it. After what you saw... Oh, Michael, I'd smack you if you were standing here right now. Please don't say that, Mrs. O'Connor. I'm sure he did what he did for a reason. Yes, 
I think so too. I suspect I might know why. I we had been talking lately. I was so anxious about about having Danny inherit his power. He disagreed, of course, but maybe not as much as I thought. It's such a dangerous thing. It, and when he met you, someone the bracelet would accept. My heart sinks. What is she saying? The Templar gave me the bracelet so his son wouldn't have to put himself into danger? Because Mrs. O'Connor was worried about what it would mean for her for their son? No, that's... Sarah must have noticed how much her words have unsettled me, because she puts a paw on my elbow. I flinch. I'm sorry, Nick. If it's because of what I said to Michael, he shouldn't have done this, even if... Even if part of me is relieved. Because Daniel won't have to put himself in danger. She nods, her eyes brimming with tears again. I feel a little numb. I, I understand. Even so, I won't blame you if you... No. No, Mrs. O'Connor, I already decided. Even if what you said is true, I'm not going to change my mind now. I can't ask you to do that. It's so selfish and unfair. Danny's been training for this. My husband did a lot to prepare him. And then turn around and force it upon an innocent bystander. It's all right. I understand. Really, don't worry about it. She sniffles into the handkerchief, giving me a long, searching look. I meet her eyes this time. Thank you. Don't mention it. We turn around and head back, silent for the moment. As we approach the gate, I spot the Baron's white fur peeking over the stone wall surrounding the cemetery. Damn, he's tall. Sarah taps me on the shoulder. Listen, Nick, if there's anything you need, don't hesitate to reach out, you hear me? Michael asked a great deal, and it's only right for me to be there for you. If you need to talk, or you're in trouble and need a safe place, whatever it is, call me or pay me a visit. I... Thank you, Mrs. O'Connor. I'm grateful for that, and I'll keep that in mind. She takes my phone to type in her number and address, and address before we part ways. Over by his car, Vince is chatting with a female calico cat. Frank is standing near them, not participating in the conversation himself. I signal him to wait instead, and instead head toward the rat. He acknowledges my approach with a nod. You have my number, right? You could have warned me that you were going to tell Mrs. O'Connor about me. I wasn't about to hide what happened from them. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that I shouldn't have been blindsided by this. I assumed a champ or the fox would warn you. They only mentioned it because I asked first. The rat works his jaw, no doubt coming up with some caustic response. I stare him down. Alright, you have a point there. Now, can we move on to more important matters? I'm grinding my teeth, I begrudgingly nod at his question. Did... how did it go with Sarah? Fine. I can tell he's waiting for me to elaborate. But when I don't, he rolls his eyes. He then looks around as if to confirm nobody's close enough to overhear us. None of this is fine, but alright. There's something else that we will need to deal with sooner or later. The director of spec is here. You don't need to talk with him right now, but you might as well. Director of what? Superpowered Persons Engagement Commission. He's our liaison with the federal government. Oh, okay, cool, but why would I want to talk to him? The Baron narrows his eyes. Haven't bothered to read the Cape Act. Haven't occurred hadn't occurred to me, no. Was I supposed to? Yes. Memorize it. Anyway, if you intend to be a superhero, the head of the commission will need to learn your identity. <laughs> yeah, right. This isn't negotiable, raccoon. You're either registered with Spec or you're a vigilante. And Templar is not a goddamn outlaw. Alright guys, I'm gonna pause it right here. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and your notification bell. Leave a super thanks or a tip if you can, it always helps. Until the next video, I love you all. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye!